The Philharmonic Society is a, was a group of 30 musicians in the first instance who, we're told, decided to get together to put on concerts on a regular basis rather than in a competitive basis so that there would be one crack orchestra all playing together for the same function. The idea of the society was formed at a dinner party on the 24th of January 1813 when the, a group of men who became the founding directors um, met to discuss the idea. They then signed a, a document, a foundation document, incorporating themselves as members of this society. Some of this narrative has to be revised, I think, in light of new research, which suggests that the real reason for the founding of the Philharmonic Society had as much or more to do with wider events in London political and social culture than music history. And that is the building of what we call Regent's Park and the Marylebone Estate Development, which needed a street going down from the park to Parliament, cutting through a formerly very old and tight neighborhood that needed renovation. The street was called Regent Street, and it was built under the direction and with the designs of John Nash, who was Regent's architect. John Nash needed clients to help pay for that street. It wasn't only a crown project, it was to be with private enterprise. So he sought different clients to put money into buildings, including houses, galleries, even churches at both ends. There was already an opera house at the bottom of the street. He redesigned the idea of a public building and a big square at the bottom of Regent Street, turned that into a quadrant, transposed the notion of a public building on that square to a pre-existing corner further north on Regent Street, which already had a little concert hall. It was called the Argyle Rooms. It was really had seen its best days already. Nobody was giving orchestral concerts in that hall. But somehow, and we don't know exactly when or who said what to whom, we will never know, Nash's plan came to the attention of some wonderful musicians who decided if we put some money together, we could buy the current old building and simply renovate it. And that would be a public building for assemblies, dances, balls, card parties, dinners, and hey, we could have orchestral concerts as well. So the notion of putting together an orchestra was not new. The notion of having regular concerts was not new. What was new, and the Philharmonic Society grabbed this idea, was to work together for a bigger project than just concerts. The reason we think of the Philharmonic Society as essentially founding itself around the notion of putting on concerts is because they did it very well, they succeeded, and they did not fail at that object. Three quarters of the members of the Philharmonic Society were born in Britain. One quarter of them were born abroad, mostly in Europe, continental Europe. The most famous name, to my reckoning, would be Johann Peter Salomon, Another would be Muzio Clementi. Um, the name on the first list that heads the list is Johann Baptist Cromer, J.B. Cromer. He was a musician of renown because his family were already musicians. His father was a great violinist who had been involved with the 18th century concerts. J.B. Cromer was a wonderful pianist, had a reputation across Europe. Another founding member of key importance was William Dance whose family were involved with music and with art and with architecture, and that is one of the ways we know this whole plan was connected with John Nash. There were factions already in this group of 30 people. Those were to play out later in the history of the society. But in the beginning, they all agreed. Some were businessmen who were running businesses for music and music printing and publishing and instrument selling, which is very important. Some of them were composers, some of them were organists, some of them were singers. They did not play instruments and would have had no role in an orchestra, so you have to ask what were those people there for? In essence, the 30 people were there to pool their energies and their money to build this building so that eventually there would be a venue that could be occupied year-round for the making of music, the teaching of musicians, and the selling of instruments and printed music. Well, there was a lot of music in London at the beginning of the 19th century. There were the concerts of ancient music. There were, there were lots of different interests in music, but most of it was choral music and smaller chamber music, but not big orchestral works. That was really a lack 
especially compared with on the continent. So I think the reason for the foundation of the Philharmonic Society was to promote instrumental music of the finest quality, but especially orchestral music. In London, there was a lot going on for a few people. It was very exciting, but it only took place in a short season, say February to May or June. And there would be subscription concerts. You had to pay your money up front. Um, we're talking about a few hundred people, no more than that. And the venue would be Hanover Square Rooms in the West End of London, or possibly at the Opera House down at the bottom of the street, Haymarket. And people were going because it was a thing to do. The really high point would be the rage for music in the 1790s, partly because there was so much competition between different orchestral musicians to put on great concerts. There was more than one orchestra, plenty of musicians to compete with each other, putting on events. So a concert series could take place uh, in alternate weeks in one venue or another venue. It was really very exciting. The musical life in in England, in London especially, the choral foundations and so on were very much run by establishment figures. But there, were, there was a growing group of people, especially some German emigres, but also people who had friends in, in Germany and on the continent, who realised that this lack of orchestral music was, was a problem that needed to be solved. So the, the people who came together to found the Philharmonic Society were not part of the main establishment, even the musical establishment of London at the time. The most important thing was for London to attract musicians from the continent who could both compose and hopefully come and conduct or play with the premiere of their own music. That would fill the hall, sell the subscription tickets up front, so the money was ready to go and the musicians would be paid. There were great composers outside England. England was not the musical centre of life and they wanted to bring that music to London. The founding directors felt very earnestly that they needed to, en to enhance the musical reputation of their city. Practically, the, the society worked by having a season of concerts. Um, it, it settled down to eight concerts a year. The season began usually in late February or early March. Um, they were always held on Monday nights. The concert began at eight o'clock in the evening. Um, but you could come in at half past seven, and they went quite late, till about 11 or half past 11. Each of the concerts had um, vocal music, as well as instrumental music, and the programs were very largely what we would call classical repertory. Beethoven was always a central spine of the repertory. There was a Beethoven symphony, or chamber music, on nearly every concert in the first season, and many seasons thereafter. But so was Haydn, so was Boccherini, and so was Mozart. Another favoured composer would have been Weber, who in fact came in person uh, for other purposes to write an opera for Covent Garden, but he also conducted at the Philharmonic Society. Carabini was brought in 1815 and created several new pieces for the Society, played in the Argyle Rooms. Spohr was another important composer who came and played his violin and brought new music for the Society. They always valued the import of European musicians, but they also used their own players to build up this new developing repertory. Many of the founding directors were fanatical about Beethoven. Many of them knew him personally, and so it was inevitable that they wanted him to, they wanted to perform his symphonies, his overtures. Members of the society had right of entry to the concerts with their subscription to the society, and partly to mark their special status and partly for ease of entry to the rooms, each one was given an ivory token with his own name on it and Philharmonic Society written on the other side. These are quite beautiful items in their own right and the British Library have them now. Um, people who were not members of the society could petition to become honorary subscribers and they would pay for the whole season up front. Um, in modern money, it would be something like um, 10 and 6 per concert. So they weren't cheap, but in the first instance, say the first seven or eight years of the concert's history, um, there were approximately 450 seats in the hall called the Argyle Rooms 
on Regent Street before it was renovated by John Nash. By the time the new building opened, it was considerably larger. The concert hall was on the first floor, so you had to go upstairs. The Nash building was quite beautiful inside with surprising spaces, um, different sized rooms, beautifully decorated, uh, flocked wallpaper, chandeliers. It was quite elaborate and colorful. The hall itself seated close on 800 people. For the opening night in March 1820, there were something like a thousand people, supposedly, that got into the first evening. The administration of the society was mainly done at, in the early years in a very rather ramshackle way by, by a few of the directors, the secretary. They didn't have an institutional office exactly. They, they, most of the, the conduct of the society took place through the personal connections of the directors. There were several changes of rules. Um, in the very beginning, the rules were quite strict, partly to protect the notion of who was allowed to come in. Because the reason the foundation of the society was so special was because it was to be permanent and it was to be a member-only society. You couldn't just wander in and buy a ticket if you were a member of the public. You had to be allowed to come. You had to be vetted. You had to know someone who already was a member. So therefore, it was a selective entry. And the notion behind that was to make sure that people really wanted to hear fine music. Because it wasn't just about building a building or raising money to create a music school. It was about promoting the very best of classical repertory, but also generating a fund so that new music could always be commissioned. Let's not forget that a, a central purpose behind the society was to create new music that could be printed and published and sold, but also to further the careers of the players who wanted to play this music and teachers who wanted to teach. If we don't continue to create new music, uh, there will not be a future for music. And that's one of the marvelous things about the current Royal Philharmonic Society's um, understanding of its own mission. That was there in the very beginning too. So it was not uh, just to produce canonic music in, in the use of that word. It was to generate new music as well, always fresh music.